I saw you at the uh, Governor's Awards the other night. Yes. So you've been a member of the Academy for, for a long time? Uh, I was a member of the Academy in one carnation when I was uh, starting in this business in 1973. I started in 66, and by 73 I had worked with um, Gregory Peck, who was then the president uh, of the Academy. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I asked him whether how, what, what does it take to join? And he said, give yourself a, a few more uh, good parts and then uh, apply. And, uh, and I did, and I got in in 1973. Then was my career plummeted downward. I felt very, oh, I felt as though I didn't belong. And I, uh, and I let my, my membership lapse. Because you weren't deserving? I somehow felt that I wasn't really part of that thing and, uh, and that I'd better uh, get my, you know, do a little more to, uh, to, to be worthy of it. And now, is it true that you did, that you had, you got like your first job as a bad guy? In um, Delta Force, yes. and then they gave you thirteen years. Thirteen of bad... years of bad guys. Wow. I, I was a good guy up until then. By then, my career was pretty, uh, pretty uh, fragile, um, and uh, and by then, I owed my agent. Now, you want to talk about a guy? This is you don't hear about these kind of things. This guy loaned me over a period of several years, over a hundred thousand dollars. Now that kept me going. Listen, this guy. Uh, Kept me going, and uh, and uh, he got me this job in uh, in in Delta Force in Israel. He said, uh, "You're going to play the bad guy," and I said, "Oh, I don't want to play the bad guy, Mike. I don't want to do that." He says, "Well, look, you, you're going to have to. That's all I can find for you. So uh, get going." And I went over to his Israel, and I uh, played this this terrorist, and uh, I didn't get another good guy job until Jackie Brown. Uh, Thirteen years later. Quentin Tarantino hands me one of the great, maybe the best job of my career. Now, the reason that he knew about you was because you were in um, a restaurant and you literally flagged him down? Yes, but... Uh, I mean, he knew about you anyway, but but you... How did you... You just you just flagged him down for no I was, reason? I, I, when Schwab's closed, Schwab's Drugstore was the great hangout. Everybody, uh, there were hundreds hundreds of regulars. There were actors and directors and publicists and and uh, hookers and hangers-on and horse players and uh, you name it, and they all went to Schwab's. It closed down uh, right near Halloween in 1983, and everyone flew to the Four Winds, and a few of us wound up at a little coffee shop on Santa Monica, and I was uh, sitting there by myself uh, in the corner out on the patio, and in walks Quentin Tarantino. Now, I had done an audition for him for Reservoir Dogs, and I thought I was going to get the part. I said, Bob, you just nailed this. You're going to get this part. And here <laughs> comes Quentin out after me. He says, listen, this isn't going to work out. I'm going to give this part to the guy I dedicated the script to. I hadn't even noticed. It was dedicated to uh, Lawrence Tierney. There you go. There you go. And I said, oh, damn it. And, uh, and uh, this was now five years later or so. Uh, he had done uh, um, Pulp Fiction by then. And, and he walked into this little restaurant. And I saw him walking into the main part. I was out on the patio. And I yelled at him. And uh, he came out and he sat down. And I was with another actor. And we blah blah for a while and kidded around. I asked him what he was doing. Uh, he said, I, uh, I'm, I'm uh, writing a... Uh, a screenplay from the novel uh, Rum Punch. Uh, uh, um, Elmer Leonard. Yeah, Elmer Leonard. He said, why don't you read it? And I did. And about six months later, I walked into the same restaurant, and I came around and threw the outside to the patio, and he's sitting in my spot, and before I can even get to him, he hands me this script. He says, here, read this, see if you'll like it. I never had anybody offer me a job ever before. It was the best job of my career. Um, I know there were big actors that wanted it. Uh, I know there were campaigns to get that role. You know, it's, it was a great role that year. It was the role that... Uh, you got nominated. And, uh, and 
so good that I got nominated. You were so good. Well, give yourself, it, give yourself bad credit. Oh, you know, uh, you can't do it. You, you can't make it up. The guy who wrote it uh, deserves ninety six percent of the credit. So, so you, you know, that changed you around. You of got, course. you got a whole new a, career out of it. A whole new career. And we wind up here with Alexander Payne. Yes. And another really great role. This yes. guy is a son of a bitch asshole. Me? A prick. What? And I'm such and a nice guy. You're playing after a bad all. guy again. Uh, you know, uh, uh, at the table read, um, Alexander very nicely said, now look, this is not an audition. We're just going to read the, 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 uh, the script. He said, uh, you don't have to overdo it. He said, everybody here got hired because they are the person that they are in the movie. Just because of your qualities, who you are, that's why you got hired. And my immediately thought, my immediate thought, and I said it out loud, uh, I couldn't help it. I said, gee, you, I'm the prick. And he uh, and got a good laugh. Course. And uh, and and I thought to myself, well, Bob, you're you're, but it's a human being, and you know this guy, and you understand he's, uh, his world is crashing down around him, and uh, everything that had been uh, cut and dried in the past. Uh, I mean, I was from the military, and uh, you're used to giving orders and taking orders and expecting things to be done when you ex when you want them to be done, and uh, life is now uh, for this guy anyway, for Scott, uh, a um, you know. Uh, no longer predictable. Uh, his uh, wife is leaving him. His daughter is leaving him. His his grandchildren disappoint him. His fa his son-in-law. Uh, uh, my daughter could have done better. Uh, mad at my son. You know everything. Everything is conspiring to give this guy a hard time. And and life is uh, not much longer for this guy. So well, when you get to the end, too, you know when you when your mortality is is in front of you, you know you you you. you you have limited options. It starts to look kind of bleak. Yes. And you're losing your child before, you know, you're supposed to. One of the to. things that you don't want to have happen. Exactly. But what what what, I, what struck me about it is that we all care about him. That's what matters. And and that you, he loves his daughter so much. Well, I have daughters. I have three daughters, and uh, you know, it's it's not hard to imagine them in straits. That uh, that might mean they can't deal, they can't help themselves anymore. Oh, I'd hate to be, I'd hate to be in that situation. I, I, I've said several times. Look, if I am ever uh, uh, in a vegetative state, pull the plug. This is not for me. I don't want. Uh, I wouldn't want to be dreaming something bad. I wouldn't want to be somewhere where I had no control over things and having a bad dream. Now, there is some humor in this. Um, there's a young kid, uh, Shailene Woodley's uh, friend, and there's a scene where you actually clock him one, totally unexpectedly. And how, he how needed that... a sock, don't you think? <laughs> this kid is a wise it. guy. He totally and, uh, deserved hey, what are you doing? And, uh, and, uh, and where do you come from? And why are you here? And I'm going to hit you. I told him. Uh, Everything as written, or how did you play that scene out? Uh, oh, that was as written. And when I read the script the first time, my first impression of that scene, I said, that's going to make the trailer. That little sock is going to get in the trailer. So, you were right. <laughs> and, I was, and I was thrilled when I heard uh, a couple of weeks ago that it made the trailer. So you've got... Um, Alexander Payne working with you. you tell me a little bit about wh what makes him good as a director. Well, he uh, he writes great stuff, uh, and uh, as, I, as I said, ninety six percent is is on the is what's written on the page. Maybe more. If it's on the page, the actor has most of the clues he or she needs to uh, to bring it to life. You gotta have a uh, you gotta internalize who that character is. You get hints from the director who you may have spoken with. Uh, there was a novel that this thing came from. You get hints from the novel. You get a lot of hints from the script. And uh, and once you internalize those and uh, learn the words, I remind actors you gotta learn those words so well that they can come out of your mouth the way thoughts come out of your mouth, not the way lines come out of your mouth. 
well so that now you can deliver the behavior which is uh, which is uh, as much a part of what you're doing as the words uh, but then you get a guy on the set who knows what he's doing and who has written those words who can shape it with just such little tiny uh, how, pieces of direction and once shaped each of those little shots and, and don't forget this is not a business of shooting a movie you go to work every day and you shoot a select number of shots maybe a dozen maybe two dozen maybe even three dozen setups a day where you get a chance to uh, work with what is a bouquet of opportunities for good timing or delivering what everybody on that set needs. Everyone needs something from you. Uh, everyone's your boss. The guy who set the lights wants you to be in them. And the one listening for the words got to hear them correctly. Otherwise, at the end of the shot, somebody says, no good for sound, start again. You've got to have done the detective work so that you know what the writer intended, what the meanings are, so that when you get to that moment in the script, you deliver the meanings that, we, that were intended when the guy who wrote it wrote it. And... Um, and, uh, and if you put the cup in the wrong spot, somebody says, no good for continuity, start again. And if you do something too big for the size shot you're in, the one behind the lens says, no good for uh, composition, start again. And, uh, and uh, the other actor who may have to do this emotionally in a scene, you've got to build him a little ramp so the guy can do this emotionally in a scene. And for the one who's cutting this picture together, you've got to understand how the roller coaster track of this movie uh, what it's like so that you can contribute to the downs and the ups and the going around the curves. And if you aren't believable, going around the curves, your audience won't, uh, they'll fly out. They won't be with you at the end of the ride. You owe something to your audience. And for the one who hired you, you've got to help bring this schedule in on time. You're not there to waste his time. A shooting day is a, is a, you know, only lasts so long. You've got to get all those shots. You've got to deliver them. And then at the end of the process, the one who's really making this movie pulls all those shots and they find ways to piece them together to make something that you as an audience enjoy. The actor only gets to shoot a, gets to create movie shots every single day. And it's a wonderful thing. Now, when you let your um, membership to the academy...